It is my pleasure to introduce um, today's speaker, Hansel Liu. In 2009, Hansel started her undergraduate at Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, or in short, shortly, KAIST, in mechanical engineering and computer science. Right after she received bachelor's of science degree in 2014, she started her master's course at the same university in mechanical engineering under the supervision of Dr. Sue Park, who gave an, a great talk at the HPL seminar a couple of years ago. Hansel's research was specialized in gate biomechanics and she spe specifically worked on how to estimate anterior posterior ground rotation force using a compliant legged walking model. After she achieved her master's degree in 2016, she came here at the University of Calgary as a visiting student working with Dr. Art Kuo. While she was working as a visiting student here, she found that HPL is an excellent place for her to work for various reasons. So she decided to stay a bit longer in Calgary and started her PhD in biomedical engineering. She's been primarily working on control of movements, specifically focusing on investigating roles of internal model and sensory feedback for control of dynamic movements in biological systems. When I asked her about one of scientific accomplishments that she's most proud of, she said that she made the first prototype of swimming robots in a, only a few hours, which to me is very impressive. Aside from um, her work career, I noticed an interesting fact about herself that she has given a new middle name to herself, um, a capital X, which, show, which is shown on the title page we see now which does not really happen in Korean name. So I asked her what the capital X means and she said it stands for extra large. So since she came up with an interesting middle name for herself, now I'm a bit curious about how she is going to give a name to the robot that she built. So Hansel, please let me know once the robot gets its own name. Today, she'll be giving a talk about fishy locomotion central pattern generator, artificial um, states estimator, and swimming robots. Whenever you're ready. Thank you, Sonu, for a nice introduction. Well, I guess people are predicted to see fish locomotion like this. So animals, generally rhythmic patterns like walking, running, and swimming. But where does the locomotor rhythmic pattern come from? Does it come from brain? Or does it lie on spinal cord? Or is it, in, is it from limb reflex? There has been studies tried to find out where the rhythm comes from, for example, this one looked at the motor pattern in a lamplay. They inserted electrodes into myotome to look at the muscle activation pattern. And this is how the muscle pattern looked like in intact swimming animal. So they tried to see whether the rhythm comes from brain. So they dissected, they, they transected the animal. So now, the animal has disconnected its spinal cord from the brain. But as you can see, it still generates rhythm. But maybe it comes from the body. So next thing they did was they had an in vitro setting where spinal cord is now completely detached from the body and now sitting in bedding solution. And you can see that still there is some rhythmic pattern so this gave an idea of rhythmic pattern generated without any rhythmic input and in the spinal cord itself. Um, this is called effective locomotion, 
when we see the locomotor pattern without any um, feedback or brain input. And this also suggests maybe there is an open loop control element in animal locomotion control. Um, I will soon talk about what open loop means. And this gives the term central pattern generator, CPG, which means a network of neurons in animal spinal cord that produce this kind of a rhythmic pattern. And people have been built some oscillator like CPG models. So I just mentioned the open loop control. Um, there is a slightly engineering term, so I will uh, explain what that is. So open loop control suggests that there will be closed loop control. So I will compare them to make it clear what they mean. Open loop control means there is a system, you put an input, system will produce output. And there is no, no loop around. In contrast, closed loop, oh, sorry. Um, so since the open loop control doesn't really refer to any other thing, the input tends to be a function of time. In contrast, closed loop control gets input to the system, it produces output, but it uses the output to generate input. So now the input is function of output, and this is also called feedback control because you are feeding in the information into the input again. So let me give some analogy with this swinging kid example. So for open loop control, you are trying to push the kid every, say, t seconds, no matter what happened to the kid. And the closed loop control approach is that you are waiting for the kids to approach the highest point and then giving a push. So it is known that they actually work together in animals. Feedback is known to modulate CPG. We can already see from our previous example of the lamp play. Even though they seem like they are all producing rhythms, they are actually different. Like uh, spinal setup or in vitro setup tend to produce much, much slower rhythm, meaning that that was a critical element in um, making intact uh, motor pattern. But we know, we know they work together, but when or through what mechanism or how strongly does the feedback modulate CPG? There has been many approaches, including a feedback slowly entrains the CPG rhythm, or some other people said feedback sometimes resets the CPG. Some other people said feedback switches CPG into different phase. But they are, um, and some of them came up with simulations, and it turns out that it does help to have it back that way. But it is uh, somewhat arbitrary, and we are still not sure how much feedback we want. So, in this project, I'd like to see how to combine CPG and feedback, and hear how it means with some cl clear objective and reasons so that it is testable and optimizable and adaptable. Um, and we want to propose that maybe state estimator is the thing to fill the gap between CPG and feedback. Uh, we are coming back to the swing example. So we try to push the kid at the highest point like this. But imagine now it is dark, then it becomes challenging to observe output. Then instead of using your observation, you try to make some predictions. Maybe you will push and then you will predict, oh, maybe I will push now. And then you will keep updating your predictions. Oh, maybe I was slightly too late, slightly too fast. And then by keep doing that, you will have a good estimation of the uh, system. 
So in an engineering representation, you are taking output and input you just gave to the system and then pull it into the state estimator and try to make an estimate and use that estimate to drive your input. Uh, we did some previous work using BIPE to working model and using state estimator. Um, one benefit of doing so is that now we can span between um, feedback gain of zero to infinity, which means we are going between one extreme case when there is only CPG, no feedback, or another extreme where there is no CPG, but we are directly using the feedback. And maybe in the middle, there is optimal use of CPG and feedback. So we tested it with simple biped working model, like this. And in the middle is the predicted optimal use of the feedback and CPG. And as we see here, that one gives us more efficient, more stable, and more consistent gait. And in this talk, I would like to test the optimal combination of CPG and feedback on fish locomotion. And the reason is that, uh, or the motivation for me was that there are more CPG research on swimming organisms like fish than ground animals. And I wanted to test the idea on a robot and thought maybe swimming robot is easier to build than uh, by the walking model than may forward the time. Okay, the first part of the talk would be on the theory of swimming over the fluid. And here I modeled the fish swimming for simulation. Here is my three link fish model. Fish has certain configuration of the angles and it will use the angular velocity as an input. And together, the configuration and the angular velocity do fluid dynamics, which we learned from the paper represented here, gives us the global motion of the whole body. And here is the simulation I built. So here for the um, earlier stage of the simulation, I built the controller to be open loop or based on time. And fish movement looks like this. Here is one example swimming pattern. So now the second link is locked and the only first link is moving. In the, on the middle is the time plot for both angles and on the right is the page plot. I'm plotting both angles against each other. And what we observe here is that if you are only moving one segment, everything you did, say, going forward is canceled out when you repeat the cycle. So the fish is generally just staying there. But you can do something more clever if you have one more link by using their page relationship in a proper way now you can go forward more than going backward and get overall moving forward motion. And here our page space diagram is on a circle instead of being on a line. And here are other examples of the fish. Uh, this is the same one. If you fix one link, the fish will stay there. 
But even if you move both links, it doesn't always guarantee you uh, moving forward. For example, this case, both links are moving exactly opposite way. And then the result motion is like this. This moves left and right, but it is staying there. Another way, if the angle is the same, the outcome motion is like this. Um, here we can compare these red and blue fishes. They are both making circle on the page diagram, but now the direction is different. For the red fish, you can see that tail is kind of following the middle link, where blue fish tail is leading other movements. And the outcome is that blue one is now going backward. So from this example, we learned that it is really critical to have a correct page relationship to obtain intended movement. So we just implemented fluid dynamic simulation for the link fish model. Learned that we can produce various patterns by altering page relationships. Second part is about difficulties of the swimming forward. Because we are not living in a perfect world, there always is some difficulties. Let's look at what that is. So when, it is, when the fish is in a perfect world, in theory, fish can move forward with open loop control. It works really fine. But the problem is that there always is noise. Noise means some um, unexpected perturbation coming from the environment, or it might be imperfect motor. So I added quite severe noise to the fish to demonstrate the effect of the process noise. You can look at the middle blue fish. It is suffering quite a lot from the process noise and it is not really going anywhere. So now we say, okay, instead of doing the time-based open loop control, let's use the exact state. Maybe process noise will affect the fish state, but we can use the affected state outcome as an input to the controller. And now, state-based control fish can move forward really nicely. Um, on the middle row, you can see the page diagram of each of the swimming. Uh, without noise, it was, it was perfectly on the circle. With noise, when you do open loop control, the state will deviate from your intended circle. And with the state-based control, because there is noise, it is not perfect, but you are staying reasonably close to the pace you wanted. But the problem is that in real life, you don't have access to the actual state information. You can only measure it. But another problem is that your sensor is also not perfect. Let's look at the effect of the sensor noise. So open loop control was suffering from the process noise. Measurement based control, you get uh, the measurement coming out of sensor directly and use that control is also affected by sensor noise. And then the swimming is again bad. You can look at the page diagram. It's not really close to circulating. So here comes our state estimator. Instead of using measurement directly, I take the measurement and combine that information with the comment, uh, fit it to the state estimator, and try to get the better estimated state. And this is the outcome I get when I use state estimator. Uh, it's doing slightly uh, much worse than using the state itself, 
but clearly it's better than any of two extremes of using open loop for measurement based. But how is the state estimator implemented in animals? Uh, to answer the question, we tried to model the state estimator using artificial neural network. So we know that this state estimator will take inputs, one from command and one from the sensor. And we will build an artificial neural network they will pro process those inputs to generate state estimate. Uh, this is on a preliminary stage, but this is the, uh, some result we got. Here we are simulating fish when there is process noise mostly, and not so much upon sensor noise. And for comparison, we look at measurement-based control and this is the result angle of the swimming fish. And although it's a bit noisy, but it does okay because there is not much of a sensor noise. But as soon as we turn the noise into a different thing, so give a new condition where we decrease process noise and instead increased sensor noise, now measurement-based control totally fails because of the increased sensor noise. However, using this ANN state estimator, so here are the weights of these neurons, uh, each of them representing weights of the command and measurement. And here is the result angle. And after changing the noise condition, uh, because sensor noise went up. Uh oh, I'm sorry, I think I labeled it the other way. So the second one must be the command rate. Command rate goes up while sensor noise or measurement, uh, sensor rate or measurement rate goes down, uh, which is the red one. And now the network is adapted to a new condition so it can keep swimming, not like the measurement-based control. So here we learned both open loop control and measurement-based control perform quite poorly when there is noise because they will suffer from process noise and sensor noise each. And state estimator improves performance by combining information. Uh, we also tested that state estimator can be represented as artificial neural network, which can adopt to new noise conditions. Okay, third part, here comes the robot. I wanted to test everything on a real robot instead of uh, living in a simulation world, because even if we are pulling some noise into the simulation, simulation is still simulation, and it cannot be the perfect representation of the reality, and we wanted to test it on real robots. What's in my fish? Here we use microprocessor Arduino, which works like a small computer. It will accept some inputs and it can generate some outputs. There's battery and microprocessor sends out motor command and power to servo motors, which are connected to other two fish links. And it's on the initial stage, so I'm using so far open loop control for this command. And here is fish moving in the air. And also moving on the table. So now we can go forward still. And I thought, okay, maybe I can pull it underwater. 
So to put it underwater, um, we need proper waterproofing. But for the prototype, we are just using plastic bag and some stones so that fish can be submerged underwater instead of floating. And I'm holding processor and battery uh, to the top part of the plastic bag. And I just put the robot underwater. And it is going forward. You can see that I'm holding the processor in my hand. And the next step, I thought, OK, maybe I can put whole thing on the fish. And instead of holding some things in the hand, maybe make it hands free. To do that, I put whole circuit onto the fish. I needed a bigger fish now and then more stones. And then simply rolled up the top of the plastic bag. And then put underwater. And here is the fish swimming by itself. So these are what I learned so far. I learned how to build fish model and I didn't really show it, but I also learned how to wirelessly communicate so that I can monitor the fish state when it is not connected to the laptop through wire. Another thing, it does swim. It's good to see that. And I said I'm so far using open loop control, but it doesn't work so, so well. Um, I showed working example, but I also found that it is very sensitive to many things like initial conditions, and it can easily deviate from its swimming motion. And here is my tired fish after swimming for a while. In the future, I'd like to implement state estimate based control and also try out online learning and adaptation, meaning fish will um, update its state estimator while swimming underwater. And if it meets new noise condition, it will uh, change its feedback gain so that it can do better in the new condition. And maybe in the future, I will bring it to the bull river and swim there. And we just saw this tired fish. Uh, it, it consumes quite a lot of batteries. And we mentioned that maybe optimal estimation will give us better energy efficiency also. So yeah, in the future, maybe the efficiency will be also improved. Okay, here is the lap up. We started with the theory of swimming forward, implemented three link fish model in fluid, and observed page relationship determines the movement. Second, we talked about difficulties of swimming forward when there is noise. So take home here is that you should be aware of noise in control systems. Control systems, including robots and also animal nervous systems. There will be noise in their sensors and also their environment and their motors. And we learned that state test mailer is a good idea. And also tested artificial neural network learning to be a state estimator and adapting to a new condition. Third part, we talked about practice of swimming forward by building a fish robot. Robotic fish swims, that's a good point. 
And in the future, I'd like to test online adaptation and more of a CPG inspired robots. Uh, thank you everyone for listening and I guess I will get some questions. Thank you, Ansel. Um, uh, that was a really interesting talk. Um, before we start the discussion and uh, question and answer period, I would like to kindly encourage to turn on your web camera um, during the discussion period if you are comfortable with it. Um, I have a feeling that it would be great if we could see each other and having more active discussion. Thank you for doing that. So if you have a, any questions for Hansol, um, please use the icon raise hand button. So the button is found if you go click reaction icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and you will see a long flat button labeled as raise hand. If your Zoom does not seem to have any that button there, then please also feel free to send me a Zoom message via chat, uh, Zoom chat, and then I'll call on you when it's your turn. Now I open the floor for the questions. Yes, Rob, please go ahead. Oh, well, I, I was, wasn't expecting to be first. Um, in motor control in walking, you might um, have a, a step cycle where you get a, um, you generate an, an error signal on what you were expecting to happen for that step cycle. And in my thinking, you would use that in feed forward to do a correction in the next step cycle. Which, so in my, my older people walking thinking, translating it to a fish, it raised two questions. One, where would you get your error signal if, if one flap didn't give you the good outcome? Where does a fish get its error signal from? And secondly, is the state estimator the same thing as feed forward or is feed forward dropped off in the, um, uh, as a fashion word to use, I don't know. So two questions. One is, where would a fish get its error signal about one flap about what it wants to do with the next one? And is your state estimator the equivalent of feed forward? I see. Uh, let me see whether I understood the question correctly. I guess what you mean that for the walking, it gets error signal from the step. Yes, you mean like uh, you will have an estimate of how long your step will take and you will get a signal when you put context well, down? Do you mean from a, from a muscle perspective, you have gamma stimulation of the muscle spindles. Mm -hmm. And, in, and if, you, if the muscle produces the right forces and things go as planned, then you don't get much output of that. But if you do get uh, uh, a bump or something rather than the spindle um, responds differently. The, the gamma bit was trying to, to um, uh, set what it was hoping was the outcome or thinking was the outcome. And, and the error signal is the difference uh, as detected by the mm -hmm. muscle spindle, which yeah. I suppose is a bit different to the thinking of, of a fish and a person have eyes and you might have an error signal that way, but to have a signal that goes into the very next next step cycle where you usually don't have much time for conscious thought, mm. is the state generator, state estimator, the same argument of feed forward to the next step? And I'm, I'm going to do the next flap different to the last flap as a fish because the last one didn't work as I expected it to. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess you're talking about maybe different levels of um, uh, collecting your signal. Maybe there can be a more continuous one where you want to compare the, say, continuous angle change of the leg. And there can be an intended pass of your angle. And do some small bumps or small water um, difference. I mean, you're 
muscular and upper rate perfect in producing movement. You can continuously sense the difference between your intended motion and your actual motion and try to compensate that. That may happen through the gamma signal. Uh, but gamma signal may also give you more of a big errors, like hitting a ground or hitting a stone near the yes. end of the step. And um, do you think that your your state by looking at your your diagrams, mm -hmm. I sort of thought that the state estimator was like it, it wasn't feedback immediately to control this blap, it mm -hmm. seemed to be in the drawings, it looked like feed forward for the next step cycle, but, or is, is feed forward not, not a, uh, uh, a thinking pattern? So I'm as... using my state estimator as a feedback controller. Um, in, a, in a sense that if you look at the angle in a more continuous way, we will be keep collecting its angle. But so maybe, it's, it's actually a part of feedback? It is, yeah, it is feedback controller. But if you define your feedback control more of a um, step to step thing, you may want to control your movement after one step, say, and then want to increase your step length or increase your step frequency. And that kind of um, feedback is not here. And there will be on maybe another level of um, feedback. So right. there can be hierarchy of the feedback. So maybe on the top level, you will control, say, speed, frequency, and step length. And then to achieve that, on a lower level, you need to control how you move, like your angle. And I'm doing feedback control on the lower level, but I'm not talking about the upper level feedback control. OK, thank you. Yeah. Would there be any other questions for Hansel? Yes, friends, please go ahead. I had a question about how you simulate the um, fluid dynamics in the, in the model. Um, that was my first question. Second question was, uh, with the robot, are you going to see if, if you can get the, the, the trail segment to lead the middle segment, if it'll actually swim backwards instead of forwards? Um, second question is easier. So yes, it does swim backward. If I do the opposite page for them, um, Maybe, yeah. And the first one, sorry, what was it? How did I do the fluid dynamics simulation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I didn't derive, derive the equation by myself. I mostly learned from a um, paper where doing the fluid dynamics. But what they are doing is basically series of conservations, conservation of linear momentum and angular momentum. But for doing that, instead of only having fish body um, in your calculation, you will also have fluid, how much linear momentum the fluid has and such. And that one is done by integrating everything from infinitely far away fluid to the closed fluid. Um, and the final equation will look like um, the translational velocity and angular velocity of the whole fish would be a function of angular velocity of the, I mean, relative angular velocity or joint angular velocity of the links. So in the model, it's all the interaction of the motion of the fish segments interacting with the fluid itself. It's not like you manipulate the velocity of the fluid itself or something like that, like a fish would be swimming upstream or anything? Mm, yes. Um, well, um, would it help if I show you some video? Let me see. Sure.
So, well, I have. Oh, yeah, I'm missing some slides. Uh oh, that's too bad. <laughs> okay, well, I meant to show you the simulation where I have like 10,000 small particles all on the fish that is implemented in Unity physics program. So, by colliding with those small water particles with the fish body, you can get forward motion. And it is quite consistent with what you get with the fluid simulation. So it is like you are looking at the collision and interaction with the fish and the fluid. But in the fluid case, you are doing the integration of the infinitely many infinitesimally small fluid particles. Cool, thanks. I see Art, you have a question for Hansel? Uh, yeah, I was just uh, wondering if you could clarify a little bit the connection between your uh, feedback control with the state estimator and uh, its relation to the thing you showed in the beginning, which was the CPG. So how are those related to each other? Um, how my state estimator is related to the CPG, is that the idea? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, um, one thing is that, so, well, um, for people who started from those biological experiments, people tend to think, oh, there is a pattern already existing in the spinal cord, and it will be like a sinusoidal wave coming from some neural oscillator. And then when people want to add feedback, there can be really infinitely many ways to do it. But we are saying instead of starting with that pattern or some arbitrarily rhythmic pattern, we will build our controller in a way that gives us optimal um, control. And to do that, we are using state estimator. And state estimator is still compatible with the CPG because it will still work with the feedback. It is just not collecting its estimate based on feedback, but it will still produce rhythm. But it produces rhythm not because it has any oscillator in it, but because it is modeling the uh, periodic motion. So well, we want to describe it that CPG or fictive locomotion was an emergent behavior, not that it was an um, evidence of some oscillator on the spinal cord. Um, actually, let me ask a, just a quick question. Um, so you, sh I think I saw almost at the end of the last part of the um, presentation, I saw a fish, but looks tired. Yes. Um, so I was just curious what would make the robot tired? Cause I initially simply just thought that maybe the battery is dead, but all of also what I kind of um, have a feeling is that um, the movement is also, also a bit different as I saw initially from what you showed us. So could you just a bit more explain about that part for me? Um, okay, the thing about the tired fish, it was tired because it ran out of battery, that was the <laughs> right guess. So as I um, switched to a new battery, it started to swim normally again. But you saw like um, some kind of a jerky movement. In that case, it was very like, giggling and then suddenly move and then that looked maybe quite different from what you would expect for the normal movement. But that is because we couldn't supply enough power to the servo motor for it to work. So in, instead of say slowing down, it showed a bit more arbitrary behavior when it doesn't get enough power. Thank you. Um, I see Arash, you have a question? Please go ahead. 
nice talk. Uh, so uh, a few years ago when I was a master's, a friend of mine was working on this uh, warm robots. And uh, I just pulled out the, uh, the uh, paper and the, it kind of looks like the, the, the whole configuration looks like the model that you, mm -hmm. you do. And he was telling me that it might have some uh, medical applications. And I was wondering, also, I'm wondering how similar the models are, if you have uh, uh, some information about that, and also uh, what the application of your model you think you will be. Mm -hmm. uh, just give me a second. Uh -huh. Aha. Yeah, let me share some screen. It may also go back to Glenn's question. I wanted to show this. So this one is my fish model interacting with several 10,000 of small water particles. And it can swim forward. Uh, it's quite slow, but similar way as my fluid simulation was doing. But I can use the same model also, like this. Uh, now it is interacting with just two words around it. And it can still move forward. And maybe some people would call it warm motion, right? So I would like to say it must be quite similar just that the um, environment it's dealing with is in this case, just two words, or maybe maybe it can be in a tube or it can be on a surface. And for the fluid fish model, it is interacting with infinitely many particles. Oops. Um, did the screen share work? People saw the fish moving Sorry, I think I lost connection for a while. Um, did people see the video of the fish model going in between words? I did, yes. Oh, okay, cool, yeah. Yes, so in that sense, it's a similar dynamics. They both interact with their environment to go forward. Um, one model maybe is interacting with more solid object like tube or desk. And my fish is interacting with infinitely many fluid particles, but other than that, it must be similar. Um, in terms of application, I think there can be medical applications like small robots swimming in a, say, body to deliver operational tool or some medicine to some place, or maybe just some observation fish model that will go under the sea and try to observe things and yeah, things like that. Yes, that's exactly what my friend was telling about the uh, about the application of that warm ro robot as well. And yeah, it's interesting if you if you can add the uh, fluid mechanics to it and it would, it would work yes. at some point, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Walter, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for a nice talk. First time that I saw a fish swimming in a plastic bag <laughs> in my entire career. So that was that's always good to see novel ideas. Um, just to clarify a thing, the um, when you talk about you know your simulation model, the way I saw it, if I saw it correctly, the three elements that you have are of the sh same shape and same length and same everything. So when you say backward or forward swimming it's really arbitrary because it's backward relative to a definition that you have for forward. Mm. But in actual fact, it's axisymmetric, isn't it? So backward is forward and forward is backward. Is, is that right? Uh, that is right that my model was using the same geometry for all the links and yeah. for the real fish, it would be different, yes. Yeah, so if you reverse the action of the backward swimming, then you get an equivalent forward swimming. Yeah, okay, that's what for I thought. For my model, that is true. And for the real fish, 
it is still similar to just reversing everything if it goes backward or forward. Yeah. But because of different mass distribution, it's a slightly different pattern. Yeah, because the, that's actually the interesting part because you know the, the physical model that you built did not have similar shapes. You know, the head was a little bit different, the head segment, the middle segment, and the end segment was smaller. And 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 I want, you know, I wondered if you played around in your simulation model with uh, different shapes and different lengths of, um, of, uh, of segments and how that would affect the coordination that you need to have, uh, if at all, if you change the shape and length of the, of the three segments that you had. Mm -hmm. have, have you tried that at all or? So yes, I can change the geometry of the links. I'm not doing that just to simplify the problem for now. Mm -hmm but I can do that. And then the answer is that it will look pretty much similar. Like yeah. if you lock one link and move only one link, as I showed, it is not going anywhere. But maybe but it's a message slightly moving around more because of the mess yeah, yeah, distribution. Yeah. But yeah. the coordination essentially would remain the same if you had a, a small head, a big trunk segment and a longish, very flat, um, tail segment, for example. So yeah. coordination is similar in a sense that usually the, um, what they call that, the parts toward the tail would be yeah. following instead of leading. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. is also found in real fishes when it has, you know, realistic okay. configuration. The, if you look at the sinusoids going onto the fish, it has the yeah, same characteristics as what I see in my model. Um, a few years ago, we had a seminar by uh, Doug Syme from Biological Sciences, and he does some work on fish swimming. And um, the seminar he gave at the time was on tuna. And he said that tuna were extremely fast, and they essentially had, you know, it's probably not quite true, but essentially a rigid body, and everything was only happening with the tail fin, mm -hmm. which reminded me of your model that only has one segment, but it doesn't go anywhere. So how, you know, if you assume for a moment, the tuna is fairly rigid in its body and has only that tail element, mm -hmm. uh, how can it fit, not only swim, but how can it swim really fast? Um, so one thing is that if you are given Lizard, two lizard segments, let's say, and you are yeah. moving it. Uh, one answer is that in my my modeling of the fluid, it cannot go anywhere, no matter how big another link it, is. And exactly, but exactly. For the, uh, maybe for the realistic fluid, there is more nonlinear effect, and maybe it can go somewhere. But I would say yeah. that, that nonlinear effect would be quite small compared to how much proportion yeah. you need. And I would guess that fish body is not totally rigid. Maybe it, has, it is quite stiff and it is compliant, but maybe it is still changing it, its shape in a and, and I'm sure, And I'm sure it does a little bit, but I actually was wondering, the other big difference, of course, is what you mentioned at the very beginning, that you have all rigid segments. And if you allowed your tail segment, let's say, to be flexible in the appropriate way. So you don't have a rigid segment, but you have a flexible segment like a fish fin would be. Um, I assume, I mean, just, I'm just thinking about this intuitively. I would, I would assume that that would actually allow you forward motion, even if you only had essentially one free segment, but it was flexible rather than, rather than, rather than rigid. So I, I wondered if, you know, what maybe want to play around with a flexible tail segment. Yes, I agree. Um, so the lesson we learn is that if you are given rigid segment, the minimum number you want is three, but you can say link infinitely many small links, sure. small rigid links, and they will give you the uh, flexible body. Mm -hmm. And there must be, yeah, there is equivalent to more than the rigid segments. So it should yeah. be able to go forward. Yeah. Have you tried to um, maximize the performance of your simulated fish so that you try to figure out 
the optimal coordination between these three segments that a certain work performed at the two joints would give you the maximum speed or the greatest distance traveled for the for the for the same amount of work that you allow have you tried to to optimize that to maximize that oh um, that's a good question and that's what i want to do in the future i did some work on it but i didn't get there yet um, the authors of the paper that I cited for the fluid dynamics has done some of that. So they optimized for, I think, minimum energy consumption for going forward for given distance. And then, yeah, they came up with a page relationship that is not really on the circle, but slightly skewed circular mm -hmm. shape. Yeah. Nice. Thanks a lot. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, so I guess this thing works well for periodic motion because then your um, your uh, state estimator or your Kalman filter, if you will, has some time to adapt, let's say. What do you think? Uh, is there a role for such a state estimator in discrete motions? So let's say I just do one time, I grab something, I reach towards something. Is then your state estimator also important, and um, and how does this work? Because then, of course, you don't really have a lot of time to um, update your um, gains on any noise, right? So, I guess this, yeah, this works well for periodic motion. But the question is, um, how well does it work for discrete motion? Mm, discrete motion, you don't mean uh, you mean not periodic, right? But yeah. you don't mean you are con you don't mean discrete control that you can do something say every few seconds. No, I mean more. Let's say a, a one-off task like. So. I see. Um, okay, I don't have that as part of my research, but my insight is that animals should have model of their own body, and then maybe there is sort of a process going like on. So you don't need to learn your body dynamics all the time when you need to move. Maybe you have a pretty good initial condition, let's say, for your state estimator, because you already know how it is to move around your limb. You know what will happen if you apply this much of a muscle force. So I would guess that maybe animals just keep their knowledge about their own body somewhere in the nervous system. And maybe that is universal for different kinds of movement. You may not need different estimator for walking and running, let's say. But maybe if you are subject to different environment or if you are, say, holding different weight, maybe you need to update a bit. So I would guess for one-time motion, maybe you just use the state estimator you already know in your system. Uh, and maybe some adaptation can happen quite quickly. Let's say if you grab a cup, you can kind of make some prediction of what will happen depending on how heavy it is, right? So I don't know whether that is part of your estimator or part of a higher <laughs> contour or something, but yeah, um, that's my guess. But um, not really proven. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. I see Tim, you have a question for Hansel? Yeah. Um, two questions, I guess, um, about the neural network. So you explained this to me before, but I forgot it. And I think you went over it pretty fast. So it might be worth it to explain it uh, one more time. How does the neural network know how to adjust the gains? Mm -hmm. So let me go back to the slide, maybe. Is it? And did I do it? Okay, here. 
Okay, I'm sorry for the confusion. Maybe I retreat now. I messed up with Major Mountain Command. Okay, my second question is going to be um, Do you think that something like that, like adjusting the gains, also happens in the human body? Yes. But you can first answer the first question, but then you, you know what the second question is coming. Okay, so here was my neural network, right? It gets input of command and measurement, and then want to do something on this rate, something smart, and want to spit out the state to estimate. And how you update this neural network is by looking at your output of the artificial neural network and comparing them that to the desired value. And now what you can do is you can compare this estimated state to your measurement. Because, um, well, assuming maybe it's a bit of a detail, but assuming, say, Gaussian noise on the measurement, if you look at it for a long time, average of the measurement should be close enough to the actual state. So you can compare the estimated state to the measurement and then for longer time period, you try to make it to follow the measurement approximately. And so you can calculate the error between your measurement and your estimated measurement and train your neural network to decrease that error. And is that the measurement or the average measurement? Um, it is the measurement. You will look at one um, one data point at a time. But since there, there is a parameter of a learning rate, you will not update your rate right away after <laughs> seeing one error. It will slowly, slowly manipulate all the rates. So it has an effect of some sort of a low pass filter. Does it make sense, Tim? Yeah, okay, I, I understand it a little bit better now. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, may I just quickly follow up on this one because I, I'm not quite clear when you say, uh, you know, you, you compare that to the desired state. Was, what is your desired state? Is that a configuration? Is that a movement? Is that an experimental measurement of a fish swimming or or what, what's, what's your desired state that you compare your oh. output of the artificial neural network to? I see. I think my choice of word was a bit bad there because desired may mean desired over movement. I may want to go forward or something. But what I meant there by saying desired is that I want my state estimator to output estimated state and that estimated state is desired <laughs> to be a good reflection of the actual state. And then to do that, you can compare the output of the state estimator, estimated state, to the measured state. And here I'm using just the configuration of the fish body, the angle of each segment, to be estimated and to be measured. So I'm using those as an uh, variables for the neural network. But maybe there can be other variables that are needed for the estimator as well, like where you are in global plane. Does it make sense, Walter? Uh, not quite yet, but we'll talk about it privately. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> and okay, and Tim, your second question. I okay, um, I don't have an evidence for this as well, but I think in real animals they also change the weight between things. Like you can think of cases when your sensor is not working so well. Like if you are walking in a dark, you make some predictions of your movement, right? You, you will try to predict when you are going to hit the ground and things more than what you do when you can actually see things. And also you can sometimes go into environment where you get more disturbance. 
and maybe that way you need to maybe see what's going on there. So from the anecdote, I would guess that animals do change their rates. OK, cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Ryan, I see you have a question for Hansel. Yeah, hey, Hansel. Um, I'm curious, uh, it seems like your controller and your state estimator work pretty well for your, your three linked fish. Um, I'm just curious if you can speculate how you expect the performance of your controller uh, would change with the complexity of, of your, your model or your robot. So for example, if you had a, a 10 linked fish, um, would the, the noise at each state estimation compound in such a way that you would expect a decline in performance or um if i add more links to my model with the estimator still do well is that your question as an example i'm just curious in in general how the state estimator would be expected to perform Mm -hmm. as a function of the complexity of your system. And then maybe an example of that is a, a fish that has more links. I see. Um, maybe it's slightly <laughs> related to Walter's question, but your state estimator may depend on your need, what you need to estimate, right? So for my example, I was only looking at the angle of its links. So angle of another link doesn't really affect another angle directly to the, uh, okay, yeah. So they are not really coupled. So having more links will only increase the complexity of my estimator by order of just linear order. But we can also imagine cases like you want to estimate the global say velocity of your whole fish, then movement of all the links would affect the global velocity, let's say. And then maybe they, will, they can you know, <laughs> make your problem complex by exponential order. So it depends on what you want to estimate using your state estimator and whether they are coupled to each other. Would there be any last question for our speaker? If not, I would like to thank Hansol again for the um, giving interesting talk.